This is the Sony VV-1 Mark II, the true successor to the OG VV pocket vlogging camera. And finally, they're giving it to us. Introducing the new 18 to 50 millimeter lens, a proper ultra wide angle zoom, easier user operation, touch navigated menu, better built-in mic, and cinematic vlog mode. So is this now the perfect vlogging everyday pocket camera, or were there compromises that had to be made? Well, let's break it down and find out. Now, before we get started, just a quick reminder, I am not an official Sony ambassador, nor is this video a paid promotion by Sony. I was sent the product ahead of its release, and all the opinions stated in this video are solely my own. However, this video is supported by a neutral entity, Squarespace, but more on them at the end of the video. All right, so let's talk about the new lens. 18 millimeter on the wide end, finally, right? Like how many years have we asked for an ultra wide angle zoom on these compact one inch sensor cameras? And it's been such a huge demand that we have third party accessories that sell these lens adapter converters to make the original ZV-1 wider. And don't worry, I'll have a separate video comparing the original ZV-1, including adapter against the ZV-1 Mark II in the future. But right now you might be asking, well, Surely after the crop, the 18 millimeter still becomes too close, right? Well, actually not quite so. You see, I thought the same when I first powered on the camera and thought, oh, wow, yeah, this is wide, but let me turn on active stabilization. But to my surprise, it's already on. So hats off to Sony, you done the ultra wide angle lens right. Now, if you're sweaty, you already looked at the specs, you will already notice that this new lens does not have built-in optical lens stabilization. And trust me, as a user who does not like electronic-only stabilization, the ZV-1 Mark II surprisingly does not have those weird digital motion blurs that you would normally see when a camera or a software tries to compensate for the shakes. It still loses out to true optical lens stabilization, but it's not too far off now compared to before. That was a bit of a rough test. Let's do something more realistic like vlogging and talking. Now, because it's wider, we see more of the bounce in the corner. It's a little bit more apparent versus the Mark 1's 24 millimeter, but the center frame does not look jarring at all. And that's where the audience will mainly focus on. Putting it side by side, the 18 millimeter does feel better for the selfie style vlogging. So let's talk about the rest of the zoom range, particularly the aperture changes. The moment we nudge the zoom rocker, we would already be at f2. f2.8 at 24 millimeter, and we hit the full f4 at 35 millimeter. That's, that's rough. All I can say is keep in mind, this is not a bokeh heavy camera, nor can we expect it to be. It's a one inch sensor after all, you're not getting much to begin with, but do be careful in low light. You can expect the same level of performance between 18 millimeter to 24 millimeter like you would from the previous ZV-1 in low light situations, but beyond that, it could be noise city in the dark. Now, coming from the OG ZV-1 with a 70 millimeter reach, you're gonna notice that the reach on the new ZV only goes up to 50 millimeter. Some might see it as a downgrade, but some would say the trade-off of having the 18 millimeter is worth it. And I'm sorta in that second camp. I'm producing a travel series this year, and oftentimes I run into situations where big cameras like this come off as too professional, and I get asked to put it away. But with my RX100 Mark 7, never had a problem. For four years, for four years, I've been raving about this camera's crazy 200 millimeter reach. But vlogging at 24 millimeter does make it a bit of a challenge. That's why I think the 18 millimeter on the ZV-1 Mark II would make a great compliment to the RX100 Mark 7. One for wide vlogging and the other for distance sniping. Moving on to video quality. And I think this is gonna disappoint some longtime RX100 and high level ZV1 users. No 4K 60p. Oh! Oh! No! Why? Why? Okay, all right. For the price and for the market they're going for, I get it. I understand. Casual and new users probably don't need 4K 60p. 1080p 60 and 120 is still gonna be good enough for most social media platforms. So I can manage my expectations there. But there are gonna be some of you who are gonna be asking about 10-bit 422. Dog, this is an entry-level point-and-shoot camera, all right? That's gonna be a lot of data for this to be writing 10-bit 422. And I don't think that would be fair. We're not quite there yet. What I think is the next logical step is H.265 XAVC HS 
4K 60p at 10 bit 420 in something like this. That format, that codec is still really high quality 4K, but in a much smaller file size, so less data to crunch. But what do I know? I'm not an engineer, I could very well be wrong. However, I am a prosumer, and all I'm asking for is 4K 60p in their next APS-C camera and in the next ZV-1 Mark III. But for now, we may not be the target demographic. Going back to what I said earlier, they are making the ZV series cameras more casual and beginner friendly. If you remember, we have features like background defocus and product showcase. And what's new is the introduction of my image style, which works like changing settings on a smartphone. When you're shooting an intelligent auto, you can control exposure and white balance by adjusting the sliders on the screen. You don't need to know how to operate traditional camera settings, and you can get the look you want with sliders and easy to understand terminologies. In addition to touch tracking, we now have touch tracking with auto auto exposure, which like on a smartphone, you can tap on an area of the screen and the camera will properly expose for it and you will have a slider appearing on the bottom to adjust exposure to your liking. Color wise and skin tones is the same as the ZV-1, at least to our eyes and our skin tones. But what's new is the Cinevlog feature. This was introduced in the ZV-E1. Basically, it automatically locks you into a cinematic frame rate of 24p and overlays two 5 by one black bars over your footage to create a more cinematic feel. And I know it sounds silly, but it's a lot of fun because it makes it more accessible for folks who still want that Hollywood look without needing to learn the complications of color grading. The available profiles honestly look really good and you can pull off a lot of different moods and vibes. And I kind of wish these cinematic colors are available without the black bars and in photo mode as well. However, if you want to dabble in cinematic color grading yourself, S-Log3 and Hybrid Log Gamma picture profiles are still available. And no, no S-Cinetone, not even in Cinevlog mode. Instead of S-Cinetone, they have Classic, which is similar enough, but apparently it does not have enough qualifications worthy enough of the title of Cinetone. Let's move on to low light. It was kind of hard to compare the low light performance as the two cameras have different lenses and varying apertures. So what I ended up doing was finding the best common ground, 24 millimeter at f2.8. Both cameras maximum ISO is 12,800 and moving backwards, the noise level were roughly the same with 3,200 being not too shabby, 1,600 being acceptable and 800 being excellent given the one inch sensor. Just to show you what the f1.8 looks like, very capable in my opinion. Keep in mind, the only way to get f1.8 on the Mark II is to be at 18 millimeter, so that's why the framing looks a little less zoomed in. And you wanna keep it on the wide end on both cameras to get the best low light performance. But remember, because the aperture shifts quicker on the Mark II, the Mark I will have to take the cake for having better ISO performance moving across the zoom range. Moving on to recording limit and overheating. Here are my findings using genuine first party Sony batteries and a V90 SD card. Keep in mind, if you plan on doing any long form recording, it's best to set the auto power temperature to high and using a fast write speed SD card. So with 4K 30p, roughly around the 43 minute mark, the heat warning popped up. It would go on to record for about 56 minutes in total before having to turn off due to high temperature. It didn't completely juice out the battery, but it was on its last bar. For 4K 24, we got about an hour and three minutes of record time. This round, it lasted until the battery died and no heat warning ever popped up. For 1080p60, we also exhausted the battery with a total of an hour and four minutes of recording. So pretty consistent. Next up, mic directivity. Trickling down from the ZV-E1, we have mic directivity, which you can prioritize the built-in mic to focus on the front, rear, or all directions. So one of the new features on these new ZV cameras is the auto directivity. So when it detects a face, it will prioritize the audio to the front directivity. But if I walk away, Oh, Jason left the frame, so now it should be prioritizing towards the rear. Let's get Jason back into frame. Jason! All right, now I'm back into the frame. Thank you for holding the camera for me. And the <laughs> audio should be kicking back in now. Now, you probably saw we have a new touch interface on the shooting screen as well as the new menu 2.0 that we've been seeing in the recent Sony cameras. Screen reader is also available in the accessibility tab for extra guidance in menu navigation. A lot of the functions can be operated via touch. We even have swipe gestures. Swiping left or right brings up a platter of options, and swiping up will bring up the quick function menu. Moving on to miscellaneous. I'm gonna rattle off some pros and cons that affects me and might affect you as well. Miscellaneous cons. 
sunny weather in 4K is still not a thing. This makes it challenging to film in bright lighting conditions, especially when we're outside during high noon. In every single one of my ZV and FX videos, I have been requesting Sony to make a detachable, multi-interface hot shoe viewfinder for these cameras. Hopefully one day, one day, we'll get one. Moving on, the power button and the mode button have always been close to one another, but this time around, the mode button works a little differently. There are times we thought we power off the camera, but we accidentally hit the mode button instead, and we end up being in S and Q. So when we shoot again, we end up with footages shot in slow motion. And while there is an indicator at the top with the mic being off that tells us we are in S and Q mode, when we get super busy during the shoot, we're not going to pay that close attention to the screen, so that could be a problem. In the original ZV, when you hit the mode button, it at least brought up a mode selection screen, and it would be hard to end up in a different mode unless you click and confirm to something else. Moving on to neutral miscellaneous. Speaking of S&Q, this doesn't affect me personally, but I know there will be a group of folks who will be very sad that the 960 frames per second high frame rate feature is not going to be in this camera. That was in the original ZV-1. S&Q does shoot better quality slow motion with higher bit rate, albeit only capped at 1080p 120 frames per second. Moving on, electronic shutter only. Again, I know there will be a group of folks who may have an issue with this. The Mark II does not have a mechanical shutter. The ZV series have always been marketed as video cameras first, with photo as a thing that it can also do. Just something to keep in mind, especially if you're coming from the OG ZV-1 with both its mechanical and electronic shutter. However, unlike the ZV-1F, this camera does have both RAW and JPEG options. Moving on to miscellaneous pros. Animal eye autofocus in video. Nice. However, no additional subject recognitions like bugs, cars, trains, and planes like we saw in the A7R5 and the ZV-E1, but that is okay. I don't think this camera really needs all that stuff anyways. Moving on, it now supports USB-C and the quarter inch 20 screw hole is moved over to the side, preventing things like tripods and quick release plates from blocking the battery door. And don't worry, we still have the built-in ND filter. Nice. And finally, price and do I recommend it? 899 USD. I wasn't expecting it to be $100 more than the original ZV-1 when it first launched. So here's what I would suggest. Now, if you have the original ZV-1 or you're thinking about picking up the original because you can save a bit of money that way, you kind of have to gauge if the wider lens and the easier operation on the Mark II would be a good enough upgrade for you. If you just need it to be wider, then again, for just $70, there is that third-party lens converter accessory, albeit it does make the whole setup front heavy. The Mark II is a nice and light package with the ultra-wide lens built in if you can justify the full cost. But if you don't have a ZV-1 or you're coming from an older point and shoot like an RX-100 Mark V or something, and you need something that's easy and simple to use for you yourself or your significant other, the ZV-1 Mark II is worth considering. And for pro users like myself, I do think it's worthy enough to add to our arsenal if we can overlook the 4K 60p. However, I'm not gonna be picking it up right away. I'm really happy with the full frame ZV-E1 right now, and I'll continue using my RX-100 Mark VII alongside with it. But I really do like the 18 millimeter on this little guy, and I'll wait closer to the end of the year to reevaluate and see if this can work for us when we film for our season three of Travel Gone Bong. We're currently editing season two right now, and you can catch season one link right up here. Trust me, our Switzerland film is going to be some of the best photography vlog you're going to see this year. If you like what I do and want to support the channel, you can do so via super thanks underneath the player or simply stick around and listen to what my sponsor Squarespace has to say. Squarespace is an all-in-one -on platform to create beautiful websites. No coding knowledge whatsoever. Perfect for people like me because I just want to make YouTube videos for you guys and not have to worry about coding my entire website. Simply just select one of their templates to get started. Every aspect is easily customizable with their drag and drop feature. Whether you're in need of a portfolio, an e-commerce store, or even a simple blog, design it with Squarespace. Use my link down below to test it out. And when you're ready to launch your first website or domain, use my code Jason Vong to save 10% off. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.